So, do you ever go back and look at the title you gave to a presentation and think, oh my God, what am I going to do with that now? <laughs> this is kind of in that ilk, unfortunately. So, you know, we, we have a few sops to uh, Peter Sellers on the way through, as you'll see, in order to match the original title so no one feels as though they didn't get their money's worth. Um, you know, it was, it was only a little while ago that we seemed to have this three-party identity system. You know, we had identity providers, people, and relying parties. Um, I'm sad to say that over the last five, eight years, I've helped raise the complexity level somewhat in a whole range of the areas that are actually on this slide right at the moment. Um, and we continue to expand. I'm spending a lot of time in the last couple of years dealing a lot with validation services and verification services and real world identity in all kinds of different ways. And this presentation has nothing to do with any of that, just so it's quite clear. Um, in case anyone is concerned, no real names or people will be harmed in the sharing of signals whatsoever. In fact, we won't actually even know who you are at all. What's interesting about all of these components is we've actually worked really hard at ensuring that we have good protocols and handling of information transfer between these various entities. What we sometimes don't think a lot about is the system level perspective about what happens in terms of the way that the underlying infrastructure, operational context works, and what kind of implications does it actually have for the way that we deal with the world and particularly identities. And so, one of the questions that comes up here is, what happens when the happy path fails? It turns out that in general, most of us tend to think of our identity systems in terms of, well, we managed to exchange message X with message Y, it worked, we're good to go. Particularly as we raise the complexity of these systems, what we're starting to find is that, that life really isn't quite like that, and that is the systems themselves begin to exchange information or behave in different ways, turns out that something that occurs on one side of the system actually can have pretty interesting implications on another. We're going to talk about some really simple use cases. Most of these, uh, the folks in this room will, will, I hope, clearly understand. But like any of these complex systems, the perspective we have is that the aggregate of the collective, the ecosystem, if you like, actually understands more as a whole than any individual viewpoint might possibly be able to provide you. And so this presentation is all about what if we were to actually construct an environment where we shared really simple, and I mean really simple, operational event information in a way that might let us get a sense of stuff that's going on, stuff being a technical term in this particular context. So, um, the second part of this, however, is could we do this in a way that actually didn't look as though it was going to destroy all possible like, uh, opportunities to actually preserve uh, privacy in this space? <clears throat> could we actually share information without making it look as though this was the NSA's latest bid to deal with meta information? All right. So here's an example. This was in my email box about 18 months ago as I was beginning to think about this problem. So, I have this email message arrive and it's from an AOL user, casting known assertions upon AOL. Connor, are you still here? That's fine. The, what we found here is that as my email provider, Google, saw the email come in, they were able to say, you know, we may have a problem here. This is the classic mugged in, name your favorite city, London, Madrid, whatever kind of problem. So having done analysis on the content of the email, Google could say to me, you may want to take a second look at this because there's potentially a problem associated with this email message. Well now, the interesting question is, having told it to me, would it have been useful for Google to have told AOL? Because if the account's been taken over, much like Matt Honan discovered about 18, 24 months ago, potentially you're in the midst of a whole world of cascading hurt, and you're about to lose the last 10 years of your family's photographs. 
Would it be useful to be able to convey some of that information and would it be good for users to do so? Could we do it in a way that actually gave them some net benefit as opposed to you know, providing any harm? All of you have gone through the password reset pattern. The password reset pattern almost invariably, and by the way, this is the account reset pattern, lest anyone should uh, seek to correct me and point out the two-factor authenticators will fix this problem, I might ask you the question, how will, it, how will you actually go about generating or allocating a new two-factor authenticator when yours gets dropped in the toilet? And the answer is almost exactly the same as this. That is, somewhere you're going to hit the, damn, I forgot the password button. As a result, the owner of the account is going to send you an email, classic URL, you click on it, hopefully time-bounded, you turn up at a new location. At that point in time, you'll be asked to enter a new password and you'll be away. The only piece of information that generally gets checked is, could you tell me what the old password is? And even that may not necessarily work depending on who you're dealing with. There are odd exceptions. But almost invariably, this is the way the pattern works, and there's not a whole lot of additional overhead or protection associated with this. The challenge, of course, is, what if my email account's been subverted? Now I'm in a world of really deep hurt. This gets to one of the many issues that we have in operational systems that we don't like to talk about, which is the actual security of even my high-value accounts is actually dependent on that of my email provider or my SMS provider. Not a way we like to think about the world a lot, but even if I've got a multi-factor authenticator in play and that account's been subverted, there's a pretty good opportunity for us to take this over. The folks at Google will attest, one of the hardest problems that they have in terms of dealing with risk analysis is, how do you ensure that the person you're about to give ownership of an account back to is the right person, as opposed to someone trying to pretend to be that person generating an account reset because they'd like to get control of the account. These are really hard problems. They've actually done an amazingly good job at dealing with this over the last few years. But this is the account reset pattern that we generally have to handle. Underlying this is the assumption that there are some trusted communications paths that we actually interact with. What are they? Well, almost invariably email and SMS. Would it be useful? for us to be able to convey from the account owners of those trusted channels that maybe there's a problem. So this is not looking at this from the perspective of very careful risk analysis of all behavior across the internet saying, hmm, there may be a problem here. It's stating that the owner of the account is stating that there is an authoritative viewpoint that this account has been suspended Maybe it's been actually taken over based on their own risk analysis processes at that location. Maybe it's been as something as simple as a password reset. Why are password resets interesting? Well, as we begin to move into this wonderful world of identity providers giving us access, particularly with long-lived sessions, to many relying parties, if you change your password at an identity provider, how many of you as relying parties are being told that the password has changed and you ought to tear down all of those sessions. Would that be a useful thing to know? So as you dig into this, what you start to find is that concepts like revocation or termination of sessions or dealing with a whole range of operational events just are not supported in the existing operational environments that we have. There's a whole wealth of really interesting information that could be shared, and it turns out that we can do almost all of it without ever having to know who the real person is that's associated with an account. So in the concept we're talking about here, real identities are out of scope. We don't care about them, don't need to know about them, and the entire system works on the basis of dealing with account identifiers, and we'll have the debate about what that means later at some point, preferably over a couple of beers. I am, you know, buying beers for me will always encourage me to give you more details at any point. The other interesting thing about this is that sharing events in most of these contexts is actually independent of the techniques, the implementation, the protocols, the mechanisms that we use in any of these spaces. In almost all cases, it turns out we have 
an exposure or at least an opportunity to be smarter about the way our systems work if we could actually convey some information that allowed us to understand a little more about what was going on. And so this is all about account level, operational events that may have meaning in the context of your system. Okay, have I now beaten that to death? We had to come up with some new naming conventions in this space, because it turns out that uh, as you begin to think about sharing information, Turns out that IDPs turn out to be an interesting place to generate events, and they're just as much interested in receiving events. So one of the examples, if you saw Emma Lindley's conversation or presentation uh, a couple of days ago, was what if you're at an identity provider, someone subverts that account, takes the information from that identity provider, walks over to another identity provider in the UK, signs up for a new account using that information, and now all of a sudden your identity has been taken over. Would it be useful for the first identity provider to say to the second identity provider, by the way, we think we might have a problem? So in this context, what we have here is a set of event publishers saying there are some authoritative statements about events that are going on that are interesting. There is this thing in the middle called a signal manager, which appears to be spelled with an extra L. There is a signal manager which takes in a set of events, applies some policy, generates a set of hopefully high uh, value uh, signals that are out the other side, and then a set of folks that may receive that. Relying parties can be just as interesting as sources for events as identity providers, and so we come up with this new set of naming which is basically places that have interesting and authoritative information about an account are event publishers, and the places that actually take that information and potentially do something with it are signal recipients. None of this is actually prescriptive. The model doesn't assume that you are telling you that you must do something. It simply says, you've probably all got some level of risk analysis process that you're going to run at your signal recipient. Here's some additional information that might actually allow you to be a little bit smarter about the way that process works. So what's a signal manager? Well, firstly, it's a trusted intermediary. Turns out you actually have to trust somebody in this life. We've tried very carefully to build in some concepts associated with this that allow us to handle some business issues. The first one is, in as many cases as possible, and use cases vary a lot, we have actually tried to hide the origin of the events themselves. So if you have a concern about, well, I don't really want people to know how many account takeovers I may have had in the last 30 seconds, we have mechanisms that actually allow you to hide who that origin is so that you can actually protect the brand associated with it. The other thing is we've been, spent a lot of time thinking about how account identifiers work, and we have managed in general to come up with a way that means that almost no additional information about accounts is actually propagated from an event publisher through to a signal manager. Uh, it's a fairly long conversation, we can have it later, but just wanted to highlight that right at the moment. Real world identities are out of scope. In this context, for example, we, we assume that identity providers, particularly in the case of the United Kingdom's Identity Assurance Program, we assume that identity providers or relying parties own the relationship with consumers, and all we really care about are the accounts. If somebody in law enforcement would like to understand what that relationship is, it turns out you can't come to the system to find that out. You have to go to the owners of the accounts to actually make that connection. So we're actually trying to ensure that we don't create additional places for information to be sourced as part of this. Identifiers are limited to account identifiers, and that is not the same as usernames, just in case anybody is wondering. Or if it is, you generally have built a fairly um, interesting system that probably is not going to work for very long. Account identifiers tend to be very large, somewhat meaningless numbers, which are only really make sense in the context of the account uh, owner that actually handles them. And then uh, there's a bunch of policy-based stuff that takes place in the, in the signal manager that deals with um, ensuring that the highest quality signals get sent to the places that actually care about them at this point. So this is basically what a signal manager looks like. A bunch of events come in, we apply some policies, and then hopefully you have some high quality signals go out the other end. So, 
Uh, what, it need, what you need to be able to do is ensure that when you tell the recipient of a signal that something has occurred, you need to be able to tell them which account in their space it actually applies to. You don't necessarily have to tell them about what the, the event origin was or what the account was that actually was responsible for generating the event in most use cases. Sorry? Uh, all kinds of conversions could be happening. So let's take a look at a couple of examples. Uh, this is an account takeover, ATO, for those of you that aren't familiar with this account takeover. Uh, please disregard any of the names on here. This is not a statement of anyone actually being involved in this, although we've talked to lots of interesting people. Uh, they're simply names as an example. So here we have uh, a case where we've got both Bank of America and AOL, and each of those sets of folks have created an account. Invariably, in your registration process, what is the one piece of information you're going to ask for as part of that account registration process? An email address. Almost guaranteed. I mean, in some cases it will be an SMS number, but almost invariably it will be an email address. Why? Because you have to communicate with folks. There is an established trusted communications path you have to build, and although we don't talk about it very much, it's the way all of our systems work. So how does this apply between, say, email providers? Well, if you're at AOL, how do you communicate if there's a problem? Well, you can't use the AOL account, because by definition, it's got a problem. You have to have some additional mechanism that allows you to share that there may be a problem. What's more, in the case of something like an ATO, you can't use the existing account, because probably there's a bad guy in control of it. So invariably, you actually need to have somebody else act as your communication path as part of this process. So here we have a case where Google might recognize that an account's been taken over. They would signal through the, through the signal manager that that process has occurred. Note that this is Andrew Nash at Gmail. It's being signaled. But what's being reported back to Bank of America or to AOL is actually Andrew Nash at that location. There's no indication that this came from the Gmail account. Now, there are arguably points where you can say, well, well, you just need to look through, you could do reverse engineering or look at the, the way the linkages occurred and you could draw the same conclusion. That's true in this particular case. There are others that's less true of. But in general, this, the principle is important here. It's saying what we're reporting back is actually a known account to the account manager and we're telling you that something interesting has occurred on it. And also notice that what we're saying is not that this is necessarily an evil event that you must immediately deal with. We're stating, hey, this is an interesting factoid about this account, the one that you own. You should think about what you want to do next. So if you saw an account reset come in, immediately after having one of these signals generated, you might want to step back and say, hmm, maybe I need to think about doing something extra just to see whether or not this is really the guy that I think it's about. But actually knowing that you ought to ask that extra question is in itself a really useful part of this process. Here's a password change event. So we have at Google a set of identity providers, a set of accounts associated with them. Um, my password's changed. That's conveyed to the signal manager. And what goes back to, in this case, eBay, is that there's been a password change account, password change associated with an eBay account at this particular point in time. Um, both of these processes you'll find actually Google talked about at IAW in October under the heading of big account changes, was it Adam? Um, Adam was the uh, author of that particular presentation, it's a great piece of work. Really what it talks about is the fact that identity providers are beginning to recognize that it's necessary to provide a whole range of additional kinds of information and context if they're going to be good identity providers that relying parties just can't simply know that, hey, an authentication happened and we've got a session. There's a set of like, downstream responsibilities or context that's probably something that needs to be shared if you're going to keep the wheels running on all of these systems. Um, we have about 20-odd uh, use cases that we've worked through in various ways. We've just given you three of the simpler ones. Um, I should say on the password change one, by the way, Google is just as interested in the reverse. So if you are a corporate entity that has an identity provider and you're using Google for its back office services, Google would really like to know, have you actually updated the password associated with the account that the session is open with, on this case, for example? 
Or, likewise, is it possible that the user that you were associated with has actually now been deprovisioned and a new user has been created maybe with the same name? So account rollovers, for example, turn out to be just as interesting in both directions. So as identity providers in the enterprise dealing with SaaS contexts, there are a whole range of interesting places that this might create additional use and value for you guys. Uh, the last use case, just to look at quickly, is what, for better word, terms, we're using an account query. Let's say I'm at eBay or PayPal, some places I had frequent association with, um, and a new account's being created. Again, you're going to ask for an email address. Would it be useful for you, do you think, if you're at PayPal, to know that the email address that's just been used was only created five minutes ago? What's the implication from a fraud risk perspective of really new accounts? Well, anybody that actually knows the patterns of the way that you actually deal with risk evaluation for financial institutions will know that the first thing you're going to do is mint a brand new email account just to get started because that's the way you need to uh, keep your identity hidden. Some recent events, lest you think that this is all purely uh, the fevered imaginings of Andrew, which is not an unreasonable assumption, just to be quite clear. Uh, we've actually been working on this now for about 18 months. We published a white paper for the UK government in September of last year called Shared Signaling. Um, it actually deals with a whole range of events out of these spaces, and they're somewhat independent of the identity space. Turns out the identity area is actually a really interesting and fruitful place to actually build a bunch of these. But we have as many in the mobile operator space and a range of others that are actually not quite even what you'd imagine to be identities related. Um, Adam actually produced a very similar kind of presentation in October that dealt with uh, large account changes. The term signals actually gets used in there. Um, and we have been in the process of building a research project with the UK government over the last four or five months, what they call a discovery project, where we've been building signal catalogs, we've been talking about transformations, what the policies need to be. We've been looking at the legal frameworks and the privacy frameworks associated with how you actually handle these kinds of participations, what the rights and responsibilities are of the individuals or entities that play in this space. And with any luck, the way it's looking, there'll be an alpha project or a um, prototype kicked off around late summer in this space. And then finally, in a fevered imagining world, we may actually, uh, and the, if the grace of God, given the grace of God, may actually pull off an NSTIC proposal as well, in which case we may have a little larger scope here in the US. So, just to finish to give you a slightly more concrete view of some of this in terms of the UK context, this was a slide that Emma Lindley used uh, on Saturday. Uh, when they talk about protecting the identity ecosystem project, it's actually shared signals that's being used in this particular form. So the concept is that there's an identity ecosystem, there are lots of players, collaboration is the key that's associated with this, and maintaining the integrity of the system is actually the desirable end goal that they're, out, that they're looking at. For the alpha project that we're kicking off in uh, August, late August, with any luck, uh, there are two kinds of event publishers that are in use in this particular space. We have a number of, EK, of UK email providers that we're engaging with. Uh, the other folks probably aren't familiar to most of you, but they are, in fact, the five commercial identity providers that are supplying identities in the context of the UK Identity Assurance Program. The expectation is that they will act as event publishers. The account takeover case is an example of that. Uh, the recipients of the signals are almost entirely the identity providers or what's known as the UK government hub, where that information will be sent back to for a bunch of other reasons we can talk about in more detail. So, uh, almost invariably the conversations descend into all kinds of interesting rat holes at this point, so I'm going to try to cover a couple of those just to sign off. To reiterate, events occur at account levels. We do not actually, in the current set or the state or the catalog of events we're dealing with, we do not look at stuff like transactional events. We don't know where you go. We don't know when you log on. We don't care what sessions are open. We don't care what URLs you hit. This is not session level stuff. So for those of you who may be concerned that this looks like 
tracking of users. This is actually information being created, generated, provided at an account level. It says nothing about where you went on the internet. We don't actually need any of that to actually deliver what we think some pretty interesting sets of value. So there's not meta information being shared here that allows for you to be tracked. If you actually look at the event and signal structures, it's an outrageously simple set of information we're sharing. That is, an event really only needs to be conveyed to us as an account within the context of the event publisher and to state what the event type is. What gets sent through after a bunch of policy processing uh, to a signal recipient is an account ID, a signal type, some other information maybe like the publisher class, for example, you might care more that uh, a financial institution rather than a social network has reported this event, just in terms of the way you might consider processing the information. Um, and there may be some priority associated with it. Turns out that we have at least one very high priority signal that we need to deal with. Uh, however, those account IDs are not the same. So what's in the event and what goes out in the signal are different account IDs. And it's information that's already known to either the signal generator, sorry, the event publisher, or the signal recipient. Those are accounts they already know about. So there's almost no additional information that's being shared here. Account IDs are already known. And I think we've pretty much beaten that to death. So how are we doing on time? All right, question. Yeah, there's a couple of interesting discovery mechanisms, Connor. Uh, one is that it's possible for you to register a known collection so that you can actually build a correlation between uh, the account. So, for example, Bank of America could say, here's the set of accounts that we care about, and here are the email addresses that are associated with that. So you can actually do a pre-population of that. Turns out that depending on the type of events that you're dealing with, there's actually an opportunity to discover those relationships in terms of doing some level of linking, but again, it's at a very low le uh, account level. It's not a transactional kind of information. But we, we have at least three ways it's possible to do that. So to follow up on that a little bit. He doesn't need Ooh, it. I get a microphone. <laughs> uh, to, to, uh, to follow up on that a little bit. Um, a lot of accounts are come sort of pre-correlated because, you know, when I open a Yahoo account, they want me to provide a Gmail account as backup or something like that. I, it, it occurred to me while you were talking that I don't know whether it's any longer actually possible to create a new Gmail account without registering it cross-correlated with some other account. Can I just be like, you know, if, I, if, I'm, if I'm 13 years old today, can I actually get a Gmail account without an existing email account? And, and if so, uh, those are, those are, you know, I can do that twice, and then I have accounts that in, are in some sense uncorrelated. What do you do about that? Uh, yeah, account correlation is an interesting problem. Uh, however, the sort of basis, that we, and we, you know, we, there are multi-generational opportunities here. We're actually starting with the simplest possible set of events and context in order to, A, prove that the damn thing will work, and to actually avoid trespassing into places that people are uncertain about at the moment. So we're trying to avoid a bunch of those. One of the things that does turn out to be interesting about this, however, is at some point, it's actually possible to begin to understand whether or not uh, multiple accounts are actually in use and actually clean up some of those things as one of the potentials that's inherent in the way the system works. Uh, but right at the moment, yeah, that's certainly a potential. However, what we've basically said is the event, sorry, the signal recipients registering interests are basically indicating what they care about. And so, yeah, could there be other accounts? Yes, but that's kind of their account level issue right at the moment, the way we're treating it. Um, and we may be able to help with that later. <laughs> However, in the account query case, we're going to know you only created it five minutes ago, so that's at least interesting. Thank you, Andrew. What, what obligations does this impose on, on the uh, entity receiving the signal to um, share, pass on some of that information or conclusions with the actual account owner? Yeah, we've, uh, in the discovery project that we've just been working through, uh, that's exactly, I'm sorry, who was the question from? Can you just raise your hand? Thanks. Um, 
uh, we actually have been working through responsibilities for both uh, event publishers and signal recipients in terms of what they need to do as behavior within the system. And uh, we can actually share a bunch of the current findings on that. It's still early days because uh, there are some good precedents in law about correct behavior and use. We expect, for example, that if you are going to register interest in an email address, that you are making a declaration that it's actually part of the account uh, connection process and that you validly have a reason for doing that. Um, and you know, we're going to be fairly restrictive on the set of people we actually do this with for some period of time to come until we understand more about that. Uh, so we've got a fairly good handle on it. We've had folks like Tom Smettinghoff spending large amounts of the UK government's money to uh, understand a bunch of that. Uh, we've also had a bunch of privacy folks looking at the privacy implications of a range of this stuff. Uh, and we think we've got an OK handle on most of it. Uh, as we begin to roll it out, we're going to learn more of it. No more questions? All right, then I think we're done.